So our colleague Pete will tell me if there's anything I've, I've left out. Um, and we should also give thanks to some of the other funders who have helped support us in, in this rather difficult uh, situation. Good. So in this paper, we're looking at livelihoods and enterprise and the way that they, they, they create economies in, and economies of scale. And I'm going to make a proposition that the lack of an adequate framework means that the broader economic contribution of refugees and IDPs is largely hidden and um, unseen. So the focus has been on individual livelihoods, but not on the cumulative effect. And it draws on our extensive uh, previous work on urban livelihoods in conflict affected settings. Uh, but this photograph is of Zattery. It's not my photograph, unfortunately, because we haven't been there yet. But as you can see, it's a hub of activities. Actually, it was established in 2012. It has about 80,000 people. Some of you may know the area. Um, but just in nine short years, we have a complex economy. Zatari is well connected. But what happens in the less well connected camps? And also significantly, what happens when communities of refugees and IDPs, displaced people or returnees, in the case of Afghanistan, move to cities. So we know that, ah, I have to do it that way. <laughs> um, this is our provocative question, a world without camps. And we know that the trends are that displaced people are increasingly moving to cities. So of the world's 88 million or so displaced people, 55 million internally displaced, and the remainder refugees or asylum seekers. Uh, estimates suggest that probably over between 50 and 60 percent live in cities, but the policy regime hasn't changed to catch up. And they move to cities to seek opportunities in work and education and social support, um, but they're vulnerable and often they join the ranks of the urban poor. So they become a subset of the urban poor who are even more vulnerable than many of the urban poor because of their experiences. And what our academic research has done is to focus on the uh, the issue of the burden of refugees rather than their potential contribution as economic agents to local economic development. Although we know well that migration adds to the, the scope and scale of local economies. So our study is a large um, comparative study. We think the first one of the outcomes of protracted displacement in camps and cities. And we have these three core concepts. So we're looking at this concept of economies, livelihoods and enterprise. And the livelihoods bit has received quite a lot. I should even stand near the screen. It's <laughs> <laughs> the livelihoods bit has received quite a lot of, uh, of attention, but the enterprise hasn't. And so, um, yeah, I think we need to go further on, don't we? I'll leave you to do this, Patricia. Okay. My thing. <laughs> so what we find from an extensive literature review is that the, the contemporary understandings of, um, uh, of the um, displaced people, refugees, is fragmented. There has been this focus on individuals. So many, there have been many livelihoods programs that have sought to support refugees in their work, in their move towards self-reliance. But we don't really know the cumulative uh, impacts of that on host societies. There's been a lot of work on the sustainable livelihoods framework, which many of you may know, which has been around since the 80s. That's a little very familiar diagram which shows refugee, the, the refugee or the individual at the, at the heart and having five assets of human, natural, uh, financial and physical capital, subject to vulnerability in policies and, pro, um, and the kind of policy context. And the aim is to improve outcomes. But we think that there are huge gaps in knowledge and gaps in the literature. And those gaps are in looking at the economic pathways, the temporal aspects, how, do, how does the ability and those assets which people bring to their livelihoods, how do they change over time? There are gaps in knowledge about the positive contributions that people make in their livelihoods to their host situation, both in camps and in urban settings. There's a lack of understanding about own account initiatives and how people draw on networks, and Patricia will talk about that, and, and the issues of trans-border economies, we think, also have been, been missed. 
And so we define displacement economies as taking these two components of livelihoods and enterprise, um, and we define them as being understood by the collective economy created by refugees and IDPs through their livelihood activity, enterprise, and need for services and consumption, and through their mutual support and their diaspora inputs. So there has been emerging work on refugee economies. We define refugee economies slightly differently. We draw on previous study that we did with IIED to think about the enterprise which is coming from displaced people themselves rather than the larger ecosystem of aid and how that influences the, uh, the development and the local economy of areas. And so what, we, what we've done is we've tried to summarize this in a framework. And the, the bit that I'm showing you at the moment is effectively the sustainable livelihoods framework. So we have here the individual refugee with their human, natural, physical, financial, and social assets. We have the vulnerability context in which they work, um, policies, institutions, and process. And we also think the economic context is important as well. Whoops. <laughs> um, and then we look at the, the strategies which individuals adopt. How do they use the networks and the outcomes? But if we move on and then start to think about the enterprises and the initiatives, the, the economic initiatives which they start to look at, we, we've done something parallel to think about those, those business activities. And they might be an individual or somebody doing repairs or somebody working in a house, but sometimes it, it can accumulate into something much larger. So if we think about this pentagon here, sorry, Patricia, <laughs> um, that we look at, we look at market access and the, the five corners of this pentagon being what access do people have to markets, what is their legal status? What are their trade networks? What space do they have access and what financial resources? They're subject to the same vulnerability framework, but then you get this interlinkage and a, an understanding of a much larger ecosystem. So I'm now going to hand over to Patricia who will talk to you about some of our very preliminary findings from this research. <laughs> So now that we have more or less in our heads what is it that we're looking for, although the, the maybe we need more time for the diagram, but we don't have it. So uh, actually, I would like to discuss with you some of the preliminary findings that we have from the quantitative survey and the pilot that we were conducting for the qualitative interviews in Nairobi. So as Alison has previously mentioned, we have completed the, and Alison and as also Lucy has mentioned previously, we have completed the data collection in three countries, actually. We are moving now to the qualitative stage, um, um, but some of the preliminary findings have already started to emerge. And they, as many times happen, as you will know, is that once you start having data, you have thoughts about it. Sometimes you have even more questions about it. Uh, so we're trying to understand what this data is, is actually saying to us. Um, so first, before I start with moving with the data, let's let's start for, for those of you who are not familiar maybe with the different contexts that we're dealing with, the actual right to work and, and right to open a known enterprise, and known an enterprise in these different countries is different for, for refugees in all of them. So we have the case in Afghanistan where returnees and IDPs we're dealing with, they are citizens of the country. So in principle, they are entitled to the same rights. We may, we can discuss whether those legal rights uh, have a de facto representation in reality and what challenges are they facing in order to access to livelihoods and also have opportunities for their own business. But that will be part of the discussion. Then in Ethiopia, there's this out of camp policy that is only applied to those refugees that are um, capable to show that they are self-reliant without working, actually. So only those that can afford it can actually have access to this out of camp policy. There is, and there is this 2000 and only Eritreans actually have, can have access to that. So in 2019 has been, there has been a change in the legal framework uh, for refugees. And it seems that there's going to be new opportunities for refugees to actually work. Till this moment, they didn't have 
access to or the right to work. Right now, they are trying to stop you to change that. They might have access to particular sectors. That's something similar to what is happening or what has been going on in Jordan. So they may have access to particular sectors, those where they cannot be, a, there will not be a competition with Eritrea, with uh, Ethiopian nationals. Then finally, we have uh, Kenya, where, um, where the government actually uh, states that, um, and, and UNHCR also states that um, those refugees that actually need assistance should go to the camps. So most of refugees are, um, invited to be, to be in camps and many times not so invited, but forced to be in camps many times. Actually, they have rights, the right to work according to the legislation, but they have to get a permit, this class, class and permit, many times it's not so easily awarded. And for in order to get that, you also have to be a registered refugee. Many refugees are in cities are not registered refugees. And when they want to re be registered, they many times get the the answer like go back to the camp and then you will be registered is easier for you. If not, if you stay in the city, it's going to take really long for you to get there. So they also are entitled to register their, their business, but at the same time, there are many barriers for them to, they have to be formalized in a certain degree. And we know many of these businesses are informal to a certain extent. So if we go to the data, and uh, we have these first numbers, we, we are going to see that's the case in Afghanistan. And what we are proposing here and we, what we, can think that this data is showing is actually how cities can give uh, displaced people more opportunities to be resilient to shocks and stresses. So we have the case of COVID-19. This data was actually collected in January, February 2021. Uh, there was a moment in, in Afghanistan when the coronavirus was hitting hard. And we can see the impact of people that were working previous to displacement and the people that were actually working now. So in the settlement in Barikab, it's out the outskirts of, of um, Kabul, but it's more like an IDP camp. We can find that nearly 70% of people interviewed may were working previous to this, previous to the COVID-19, and this was reduced significantly to 52%. While in the city, even if we depart from a really lower rate of people working, we could see only 39% were working. We could see that when COVID-19 strike, this rise to 53%, they have more access to new employment. And then maybe they were in need to get employment. Maybe they, there was a reduction in remittances or whatever, but they were capable to actually respond to that. We know it's there's a difference. It seems that this indicates that actually in the camp, you have more access to employment, but we have uh, some other data that actually points to uh, the quality of that work and maybe not be enough to cover for needs. Because when we ask them what, it's, uh, the, your, what are your main, main concerns in camps, in, in BioCAP, actually 87% actually said that it was the lack of work that was really worrying them. While you take, a, take the same question to Jalalabad, to the city, it was only close to 25% and mentioned that it was the lack of, of employment. Um, and they were otherwise pointed to the high cost of, cost of living and the corruption as their main concerns in cities and not so much about work. Yeah. So this one is not moving. Okay. So um, also here in, 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 in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, we wanted to, to reflect about the amount of human capital that is actually not um, absorbed and is not uh, is it wasted somehow? So we had the percentage of people that were actually working before displacement, both men and women, you can see 71% and 41% of, of uh, Eritrean refugees were working previous to displacement, only 34% and 7% were working afterwards. We can discuss about the reasons later. If there are questions about that, I have many other ways to, <sighs> why this is not working now? Okay, so I wanna take you to, to a journey with me so I can explain to you the importance of, of networks. That's one of the things that is really important in the diagram where we're trying to understand the pathways of refugees. So let me take you to, to the journey of this uh, Somali guy that once first moved to, to the camp. When he arrived in the camp, he decided not to register. He had a bad relation with, with the camp authorities or, or not a good relation, not a good connection with the camp authorities. And instead, joined this group of young male refugees and moved to the city, to Nairobi. When he arrived there, he actually had the opportunity to be hired by an enterprise by a refugee. 
And in that enterprise, he actually made a friend, a really good friend. And together they decided that in five years, they will be saving all the money that they can in order to open their own business because they were not planning to be employees for the rest of their lives. They want to run their own stuff. At that time, they were having issues with the police because they weren't, uh, he was mostly <laughs> having problems with the police, but also his friend because he was Somali Kenyan. So many times he was confused with the refugees and they have, they have been chased many times. So this is the next step. So five years after that, we have our friends actually starting a business with his friend only five years after. They started by, by buying the supplies from wholesalers for free. They were getting this for free. They were repaying later with zero interest. And little by little, they, were, they managed to grow and actually afford to buy from these wholesalers. Then they decided to associate with eight other businesses in order to expand their business and be able to actually get uh, goods from China and Uganda. They were paying jointly for the shipment so they can divide the cost of doing that. And they were slowly, slowly improving the quality of their business. They have uh, also a direct uh, direction with uh, direct, uh, direct communication and frequent communication with their customers through a line that was all the time open for them to receive um, claims for goods. And finally, they have problems sometimes at customs with the, the change. There was a change in problems. So now they have problems with customs when they are, were trying to import things from China and Uganda. So you can see there's a movement of actors. They are no longer, first they were refugees, now they are other. And finally, we have this one that is much more complicated <laughs> that I don't have time to say. <laughs> so I think just very quickly to wrap up, um, our findings are at an early stage. We want to map this back onto the framework. Um, we, we think that the displacement of economies framework will do that, but what it also helps us do is accept as a reality the urban component of displacement and enable us to look at the positive elements of that. Thank you. Thank you.